When you move in Jesus' direction, he gives you the desire and the ability to live differently. It's not something that you can do on your own. It's something Jesus can do for you. It's exciting. It's the abundant life. So good morning, Sharp Town friends. If we haven't met, my name's Kristen. I'm on the pastoral team here at Sharp Town Church and thrilled, as always, when I have the opportunity to speak this morning. What a privilege and an honor it is to speak for Jesus here from this platform. I'm going to say that if you don't have a Bible in front of you today, I'm going to encourage you to grab one. We have a bunch of Bibles back there on the Bible bookshelf. Many of you have an app on your phone or you brought your Bibles with you. And certainly we'll have slides on the screen, but there's something worthwhile about having God's Word open in front of you because we're going to refer back and forth a few times to a few different places in John chapter 11. And so during the Lenten season, we've been talking about turning points in the life of Jesus. Defining moments in his life where those around him witnessed his power, his love, his ability to heal. They recognized his deity as he declared his deity. I imagine, like me, there are turning point moments in your own lives where you've witnessed the power of Jesus, where you have felt his love, where you've experienced his ability to heal or he has helped you. And you've known without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. These turning points for me and for some of you probably have come in moments of worship right here inside of this room. They probably come during your own personal prayer times in your living room. Perhaps some have happened here at this altar. Or maybe through the witness of other believers as they've shared their experiences with you. And it's led you closer to who Jesus is. For me, the more that I study his word, the more that I read, the more that I pray, I become even more convinced of who he says he is. As a matter of fact, at this point in my life, I have a hard time understanding why it is that some people don't believe in Jesus and who he says he is. And so that's a prayer for me for folks that I know that don't trust Jesus yet. That my witness, that our witness, that what we share and how we pray leads people right to his throne. Just last week out of John chapter 10, we studied a passage from scripture where Jesus straight up said, I am. He said, I am the same God at the burning bush who said, I am who I am. Just Friday night, I was at Sight and Sound Theater, and that scene unfolded on the stage where Moses approached the burning bush, and you heard this booming sound almost from heaven, where Moses said, who shall I say is sending me? And God says, I am. Tell them I am. Jesus declared, I am, in John chapter 10. And when Jesus made that statement, Folks who heard him make this claim, despite the fact that they had heard him speak, they had been astounded by the miracles that they had seen him perform, they deemed him a heretic and they picked up rocks with every intention to stone him and kill him. Stoning someone was was one of the ways that they would murder folks in the time of Jesus' day. Can you imagine? Someone hating you that much, wanting you to die that way? We closed our service last week out of John chapter 10, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus eluded their grasp, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he stayed there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, Yet everything John said about this man was true, and many believed him there. And so after Jesus declared, I am, the Father and I are one, and folks picked up stones to try to kill him, Scripture says that he eluded their grasp, and he went off to a place where he would be safe for a little while longer. And so today we pick up where we left off last week, the last chapter in the life of Jesus before he triumphantly enters Jerusalem, 
where folks waved palm branches and shouted Hosanna? That's our message next week. And church, can I say to you, you don't want to miss being in person next week. It's going to be a grand celebration as we give out palm branches, as we sing jumping up and down. If you're joining us online this morning, you've not yet made your way back into this room or you've become comfortable having your coffee and watching TV online. Let me encourage you next week. Next week, you will want to be here in this room as we celebrate that moment and we shout Hosanna. You'll want to be with us the week after that as we gather all together as one church, both our early service and our second service and our community out at Cowtown. You want to be here for those celebrations. But today, our text is the chapter right before this moment. Our text is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're going to talk about the details that unfolded before, during, and after that event as recorded in John chapter 11. So before we read this passage, would you pray with me one more time that God would open our eyes as we read this passage together. Father, I pray that as we open your word this morning and as we read from John chapter 11, Father, that you would teach us this morning. That you would be the one who teaches, that you would speak through me, that your scripture would unfold before our eyes. So that we have a new understanding about who you are. That it makes a difference in our lives that as we leave this room, we will be different people. Encouraged, touched, different, because we've been with you. Thank you for your words and scripture. In your name we pray. Amen. So church, I've mentioned to you before that as part of my seminary journey, I'm required to spend an hour in God's word and in prayer each and every day. And some of you have asked me how it is that I can possibly find an hour. And I'll tell you, some days it's difficult. But I've mentioned before that oftentimes I listen to God's word while I'm in the car through the YouVersion Bible app. And I don't think that's cheating at all. If God's word is being read to me and I'm being filled with his word, whether I'm sitting down at the table or listening to it in the car, it's all valuable. And so this morning, as we read from part of John chapter 11, I want to give you a taste of what that sounds like. So we have a little experiment up here. I have my phone up here, and I'm going to try to play the beginning of John chapter 11 for you, similar to what I do frequently in my car. And so if you have your Bibles, you'll want to turn to John chapter 11. It will be on the screen and follow along. And we're going to have the YouVersion Bible app read to us for the first several verses. of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, 
Let us also go, so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her When they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. And so we pause there for a bit. How does that feel having scripture read to you? I've come into this habit, and I just love having it read to me when I'm in the car. And so as we heard in that passage, there is so much going on and so much taking place that we could spend five, six, seven weeks alone just unpacking this passage. Admittedly, I'm going to try to cover way too much this morning in the next 20 minutes. I know that. But I don't have the opportunity to share that much, and there is so much that God has laid on my heart to share with you this morning and to encourage you with. So first, before we even pick up after that passage, there's a couple things that I want to talk about from what we already heard. There's really three things that I want to highlight. And then we're going to pick up the rest of that chapter, the turning point in Jesus' life. First is this. You'll hear and you'll remember that what we read or your Bible in front of you, that when Mary and Martha called for Jesus, he didn't come right away. Lazarus was sick, but Jesus didn't come. And as a matter of fact, when he first got word, Lazarus was still sick. But then you'll remember that he said to his disciples, Lazarus is sleeping. And they said, well, if he's sleeping, do we really need to go? And then he plainly said to them, Lazarus is dead. And he said, we're delaying getting there so that God's glory will be on full display. Because Jesus was teaching and training his disciples. 
he wanted specifically intentionally to wait so that God's glory would be on full display. The lack of movement, the lack of responding right away was on purpose. It was not a mistake. And I'm pretty sure that Mary and Martha didn't understand that. They didn't know that. They didn't know that Jesus was waiting so that God's glory would be on full display. And I think that's the case for you and I as well. When God doesn't seem to be moving in response to our requests, it doesn't make sense to us. We don't understand why and we're looking for answers. And when Jesus finally decided that it was time to go, his disciples reminded him, do you really want to go back to that place? The last time we were there, folks were trying to kill you. I imagine that Jesus was thinking, really, the whole reason I came was so that I would die for you. I'm not afraid to go back there. All of this was in God's timing. And do you notice that when Jesus gets back to town and Martha runs out to meet him, she says, if only, Jesus, if only you had been here. Church, I wonder how many times, I know I've said those words, if only. How many times have you prayed or you've reached out to Jesus or you've used those words, if only? I imagine that many of us have had those thoughts. If only God had shown up. If only God had answered my prayer. If only God had intervened. Or maybe it looks like this. If only I hadn't made this mistake if only I had made a bad choice. Church, I think we need to stop using that kind of language because the Bible says that God works things out for his glory, for the good of those who love him and accept him. And as I was thinking about this this morning, I recognize that we're using that language a lot in regard to the situation we find ourselves in with the United Methodist Church. We say things like, I've said things like, if only we weren't in the New Jersey conference. If only we had another bishop. If only we'd prepared sooner. If only we had $2 million. Guess what? I'm thinking that that's language that we should just stop using because God has raised Sharptown Church up so that he would be glorified. And we don't always have to know the how and the when and what's next. Something good is coming. Something good was coming for Mary and Martha. They couldn't possibly have imagined what was coming. They could not possibly have fathomed Jesus' plan because dead people stay dead. They would have had no idea that Jesus was going to come and bring Lazarus back from the grave. Jesus was setting the stage for his own death and his own resurrection. Here's the second thing. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they were close friends with Jesus. This is evidenced by their request to have Jesus come back to this area where folks had already tried to kill him. Their friendship was one that they felt like they could just reach out to him and ask, and he would come, and he would show up. And when Jesus comes back to Bethany... Their relationship and what he knew about these women was on full display. Because when Martha runs out to beat him, he provides just what she needs. He has a whole conversation with her. He almost has this theological conversation with her and offers some words of explanation. He even says to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live and never die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he says to her, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And when she had said this, Jesus had had this whole conversation with her. He met her in her area of need. He talked to her in a way that was appropriate for her. And when he had alleviated her fears, Scripture says that then she went to get her sister, and then Mary arrives on the scene. There had been a whole bunch of folks at Mary and Martha's home who'd been there to mourn with them. And they follow Mary here to, she leaves her home and she comes to this scene where Jesus is. And scripture says, 
the shortest verse in all of the Bible that when Jesus got there, he wept. Weeping is not just leaking a little bit. It's not just crying a little bit or trying to hold it in. Weeping is this gut-wrenching, almost meaning to, to quake. Jesus wasn't just teary-eyed. He shook with emotion from the depth of his soul. If you've ever wept uncontrollably and in anguish, you know what I mean. Mary needed Jesus to cry with her. He had a conversation with Martha, and he shows up at the tomb, and he weeps with Mary. And church, I want to say to you that faith in God and the pain of separation and loss, they can go hand in hand. Doug Manning, a pastor, wrote a book that says, Don't Take My Grief Away, and he talks about a young couple whose 18-month-old daughter developed croup and was taken to the hospital. She was put under oxygen and given antibiotics, and in spite of everything the doctors did, she died less than an hour later. When Pastor Doug Manning got there, he was a young clergy person, and the mom was crying out hysterically. She was weeping. And he said to her, there, there, you need to get a hold of yourself. He said the young woman looked at him straight in the eye with fire in her voice, and she said, don't you dare take my grief away from me. I deserve it, and I'm going to have it. This Pastor Manning said that he learned from experience how important grief is to the healing process. And he writes, Grieving is as natural as crying when you're hurt, sleeping when you're tired, eating when you're hungry, or sneezing when your nose itches. It's nature's way of healing a broken heart. When Jesus was confronted with the death of a close friend, he wept. Friends, can I remind you this morning of what I know you already know? Jesus knows you. He knows your thoughts. He knows your needs. And I promise you that he will meet you right where your area of need is. If we had time this morning to pass around the microphone, many of you would share words of testimony where Jesus has met you right where you've been at in your time of struggle. Just the other evening, Selena and I were having dinner at Applebee's. And as we sat there at the table, we'd been there for several hours. We were wondering why we were there that long when a gentleman walked up to our table. He stood there with tears in his eyes. He had a hard time composing himself. He was much older than either one of us. And he said, give me a minute standing right there at Applebee's. Do you remember we had some, our young folks on the platform singing last Sunday, part of a group from Young Life that was leading a worship night just this past Monday? Well, last minute, this gentleman and his wife, they lived down the street, they decided to just show up at the old Christian Academy and come to the worship night. And as he stood there at our table, weeping, he said that somehow, in a way that he can't explain or a way he can't describe, God met him that evening through that worship night, through the lyrics and through the testimonies. And he proceeded to tell us what God had done in his life in the last couple days since Monday. While he had this major interaction and moment with God on Monday evening, can I tell you how neat it was for Selena and I to be able to hear his story there in Applebee's. His testimony and his witness impacted and encouraged our souls. Church, let me continue to remind you to share your story. It encourages other believers and helps other people understand more about our Jesus. And here's a third thing. When Jesus arrived at the tomb, he asked someone to roll the stone away. He could have done that himself, or he could have had an angel do it, but he asked somebody in the crowd to do it. And when he called Lazarus to come out of the tomb, he asked somebody in the crowd to unbind him. Jesus didn't need help, but he asked for other folks around to be involved in this miraculous moment. Friends, can I tell you that when you're caught in areas of sin, or you're discouraged, or you have feelings of unworthiness, 
where you don't know what's next in life, or you feel locked up and bound up, Jesus will use other people to help move you forward. If you were to look around this room, these are the folks that Jesus is going to probably use to intersect your life. If you're privileged enough, Jesus will use you. He wants to use each and every one of us. He doesn't need our help, but he enlists our help anyway. Because collectively, we reflect his image. These were some of the things that Jesus was teaching his disciples in this miraculous bringing Lazarus back from the dead. He was teaching his disciples and the entire community that he is victorious over death. A foreshadowing of what was to come, Jesus brought a dead man back to life. One who'd been dead for four days. And those who witnessed that miracle, they had to be in complete awe. And there were a lot of witnesses to Lazarus' resurrection. Many had come to Bethany to comfort Mary and Martha, and when Mary left to go to the tomb, they went with her. So when Jesus called Lazarus forth from the grave, John recounts that many people believed in Jesus. But there were some who instead went to tell the Pharisees. That's what we read in verse 45. Many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he'd done believed in him, but some went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. We don't know their motive. It might have just been to offer a report what happened, or they might have been hostile to Jesus. But upon hearing this news, the chief priests and the Pharisees immediately gathered together a council, probably an unofficial meeting of the Sanhedrin, made up of about 70 folks who were priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, some local political leaders, who for the most part could never get along until this moment. The chief priests and Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. The words that they speak here are incredible, almost beyond belief. They don't seem to express any doubt in the power of Jesus Christ. They don't deny evidence in support of what has already happened. As a matter of fact, the claims about Jesus being God and who he said he is continue to pile up, and they don't offer a rebuttal for this. They virtually almost admit that it's all true. Yet they're paranoid, and they're afraid, and they're jealous. And they're concerned that they are going to lead, they're going to lose their place in society. Because you see, the Roman government allowed them to have the power that they did. And if there was any unrest or any, any kind of uprising, they were concerned that Rome was going to come and put its foot down. And they would lose the power that they had. And so at this meeting at this council, was Caiaphas, who was the high priest, probably got there by ungodly ways. He probably either paid off the Roman government or he played the political game. He wasn't there because of his spiritual maturity. But he's serving as the high priest, and in this council he says, you all know nothing. And after he insulted the intelligence of those in the crowd, he went on to offer a solution. And he said these words, Nor do you consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Think of the irony of the words of the high priest. Jesus had just raised a man from the dead, and they decide that the best way to counteract the Lord's ministry is to kill him? The one who gives life. Are you kidding me? How naive they were. These people were so threatened, so much in a state of panic that they weren't thinking clearly at all. The best way to rid the one who can raise the dead is to put him to death. Their rebellious unbelief seems to have blinded their reasoning. But you know, these words were not just words spouted out by an angry, paranoid religious leader. 
Caiaphas was the high priest. And what comes with that role all the way back to Leviticus was the fact that the high priest would have the ability to offer words of prophecy, to declare what can only be known by divine intervention. And in this moment and with these words, God was faithful to the position of high priest. Even though the man currently holding this position was anything but godly. We know this because in verse 51 we read, Caiaphas did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather one of the children of God into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. It's incredible that Caiaphas became a prophet, but the words that he spoke are even more incredible. That Jesus was going to die for the nation. The preposition here means on behalf of. It's the idea of substitution. That Jesus would die as a substitution for the nation and substitutions at the heart of the gospel. Of course, the self-absorbed Caiaphas could not fathom the truth that crossed his own lips. That Jesus had to die and would die willingly not to keep the political system intact, but to become the atoning sacrifice for the Jewish nation and for all people. And so here we reach a turning point. The final turning point in the life of Jesus. Because in verse 53... We read these words. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious leaders made a decision here at this emergency council meeting because Lazarus was raised from the dead and they couldn't rebut what was happening. They made the decision to kill him. Jesus could no longer walk publicly among the Jews, but he went away to the country near the wilderness where he stayed with his disciples. Passover was near. The chief priests and the Pharisees had given strict orders that if anybody knew where he was to report it so they might seize him. The Passover feast was coming soon. I'm sure they thought that Jesus would be there, and they said, if anybody sees him, we have a hit out on his life. These responses to me demonstrate the sovereignty of God even over wicked purposes. Do you remember back in Genesis where we're told of Joseph's words to his 11 brothers? He revealed himself to them after he became a leading power in Egypt, long after his brothers had cruelly sold him into slavery. He was now in a position to serve them, to keep them alive. And he told them, but as for you, you meant it for evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring about this day to save many people alive. That statement illustrates to me what happens again at the end of John chapter 11. Here we see powerful but frightened men plot evil against the Son of God. But the very evil they meant for God and his sovereignty, God meant for good and for the salvation of many. The council entered into its conspiracy to murder Jesus. At this time, there was no charge brought against Jesus. There was no trial. There was no witnesses. There was no one present to defend him. Yet they condemned him to death. Months before his arrest and trial in Jerusalem, it had already been decided he was guilty, and that was that. But as so often happens with ungodly men that God places in positions of power, Caiaphas' words and his evil plot meant far more in the purposes of God than he ever could have realized. God used him. And God can use ungodly people to accomplish his tasks. As we close, I have just two more takeaways. And remember, I said I was going to cover way too much, and I realized that. 
But there's two more things that I want to say before we close. I wonder this morning if some of us are still living like the Sadducees or the Pharisees. Perhaps we come to church on Sunday morning and we can't discount the things that we're hearing in Scripture. That we hear these stories and we see how people's lives are being touched. But we haven't yet embraced Jesus for ourselves. Perhaps because it might threaten our livelihood or our way of life. What are you afraid of? That God might convict you of sin and you'll have to live differently? Friends, let me say that's nothing to be afraid of. When you move in Jesus' direction, he gives you the desire and the ability to live differently. It's not something that you can do on your own. It's something Jesus can do for you. It's exciting. It's the abundant life. Listen, it's okay if you feel like you don't know how to pray or you don't know how to find scripture to read in the Bible or you don't know anything at all about God or you feel completely unworthy. Thankfully, Jesus didn't die for the worthy. We're all unworthy. Look at how silly all those unbelievers were in John chapter 11. Although I'm not so sure that you can call them unbelievers. They recognized Jesus for who he was. Would you recognize Jesus for who he is this morning and take a step? Get over yourself. Just say to Jesus, I believe who you say you are. Thank you for dying for my sin. Forgive me of my sin and start a relationship with him. It's not that complicated. We make it complicated doesn't have to be and for those of you who are already Christians think about Lazarus life and his story indulge me for just a moment imagine the resurrected Lazarus showing up at your dinner party and talking about being dead and now he's alive talking about being in the tomb and walking out of the tomb shouting that hey Jesus called me back to life. He called me to life out of the grave. This leads me to the greatest takeaways of this account. We can understand why Lazarus would have told everybody that he met. It's an amazing story. But friends, can I say to you, we also have an amazing story. Those of us who walk with Jesus, we have an amazing story to tell. We have a story to tell that we can tell folks the minute that God's voice called to us from the grave, called us by name, and bellowed us to come forth out of the grave. When was the last time you said to someone, hey, have I ever told you the story about when I was dead and Jesus called me out of the grave? Maybe today's the day to share that story. This story was a turning point for Jesus. And it can be a turning point for you as well. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Jesus, all throughout the New Testament, as we read the story of your life, we are astounded and in awe of who you are, of what you've done, of your love for us. God, this morning as we unpack the story of Lazarus, God, it's miraculous. You called him out of the grave. God, there was a moment for all of us where we were dead in our sin, and you called us by name. You called us out of the grave. God, may we be willing to share that story. For the folks in this room who have never answered when you've called, God, may today be the day that when you call us by name, if we haven't yet answered and started a relationship with you, that today would be the day that we would set aside whatever hindrances are in the way and that we would come to be in a saving relationship with you. And Jesus, we're grateful. We're grateful for this turning point in in your life. 
that while you were completely innocent, a council convenes with no trial, with no evidence, with no jury, and sentences you to death. Oh, did they think they had the upper hand. But God, you were on the throne all along. This was your plan all along. This turning point, this defining moment was your plan since the beginning of time. God, may we once again today be grateful. May we once again be excited. May we once again shout your praises. We thank you that you were willing to come and to die for us, even though we're not worthy. We're grateful. We celebrate you, and we worship you, and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here, friends. We'd love for you to stay for Sunday school.